All right, so this is a talk on how I follow up my patients after revascularization. I don't do revascularization, but I have lots of friends who do, and some of my best friends are interventionists. Um, here are my disclosures. There's nothing related. Uh, this is a just, I'm going to put this up here because this is a study that tells us that we're never going to stop doing these kinds of procedures. This is a population cohort of more than 100,000 people, and if you take a look at, uh, this is for limb salvage in patients who had critical limb ischemia, and if you take a look here at the top half or the bottom half, what it shows you is that if you revascularize people who have critical limb ischemia, you're going to save the limbs. And that the closer you get to current date as you move down, the more likely it is that our interventions are going to make a difference. This is critical limb ischemia, this is critical limb ischemia, and the ratios of making sure the leg stays on always get better. The problem is, the problem is that our interventions uh, don't always work, right? Or uh, let me rephrase that, they don't always do what we want them to do, they don't always stay open. This was an interesting, interesting study of 2,300 patients who were getting infraequinal lower extremity bypass after they, because they needed a secondary procedure. And what we can see over time is that if you take a look at 2003, the rate of total secondary procedures was 22%, and it climbs over the course of the next eight or nine years up to 38 to 40%. And the brown bars are in patients who had critical limb ischemia, and so we're doing more revascularization in the sicker people. And so we have to think about um, worrying that our intervention is going to work to help keep the limbs attached. As we do more and more serious work, we're going to be doing more and more secondary procedures. And if we take a look here at from what uh, beginning we're starting, whether this is with a vascular, endovascular intervention or surgery, it certainly looks like um, there is a bit of an improvement that you don't have a second procedure if you have surgery, but in all groups, the rate of secondary intervention is going up over time. Uh, and you can see here the rate of secondary intervention in patients who have CLI in this middle group hits about 25%. Uh, in the most recent year, which is 2011. Now, why does, why does this make a difference? Well, if you're going to be revascularized and need a secondary revascularization, your rate of male-free survival is significantly lower than if you don't. So there are two ways to really combat this problem, right? The first way to combat this problem uh, is to make sure that you have better technologies that don't close up so you don't have to worry about needing a secondary revascularization. And the other way to do it is to follow your interventions so they don't close up and you can, uh, you can get to them when they are beginning to move to be in trouble rather than when there is trouble already on the ground. And if we just take a look here at one of several studies that's been published, you can see that if you do uh, surveillance, it, and this is the best word I'm going to be able to use, it likely reduces the total failure of outcomes. And so, Particularly with the patients with critical limb ischemia, we are more likely to prevent things like ma major amputation, but these numbers are small and it becomes hard to figure out if we're actually making a big difference. With all of the data that's out there, you want to know what the leaders in the field are doing, and here is what the, um, here are the schedule of measurements from the best CLI trial, right? So this is the, the most important critical limb ischemia study that's going out there now, and I, so I've put in a red box when they would do an arterial duplex if it's standard of care in the institution. And that's at one month, three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, and 48 months. Uh, I would like just by a show of hands to see if anybody in the room is following up their endovascular interventions or even surgical revascularizations with this time schedule. As a very small minority of people, uh, I would say a plurality on the stage. Uh, I think we all underestimate how much surveillance we should do. Now, what does screening mean? I probably should have started with this, but screening is not just sending them to the lab for an ultrasound. In fact, it's whenever you see them, you obviously have to inspect and examine the lower extremities, right? So differences in color and temperature and pulse palpation either compared to the other leg or compared to what you've documented to previous, are important indicators that things may be happening. They're not amazingly sensitive or specific because, uh, and I don't, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, but most people aren't really good at feeling pulses and temperature. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, the other way to do it is just by doing an ankle brachial index in your office. You can see if there's a bigger pressure drop than you would expect it or had been present last time. And then finally, obviously, there's duplex ultrasound. Uh, and duplex ultrasound is the, uh, is the gold standard for determining if there's a problem within, uh, within the revascularization. So I think this, the, the Society for Vascular Surgery has actually put out the best surveillance schedule and the one that I think most of us should be following. This is not as aggressive as you saw was being happening in the best CLI program. But I think this is the one that makes the most sense, and they've separated it out by different locations. Okay, these are the surgical time points, and I'll show you the endovascular ones. But basically for surgery, um, it's baseline six months, 12 months, and annually. The difference for there is the only one different is the infrainguinal bypass at three months. For the endovascular schedule, and I want to see how many people are doing this, but they recommend a one-month post-procedure physical exam, ankle brachial index, and uh, duplex ultrasound. And then outside of the aortoiliac segment, which rarely goes down at these time points, everything else gets a three-month scan, and then everything gets a scan at six, 12, six months, 12 months, and annually thereafter. You will notice the aortoiliac segment, segment is plus or minus um, duplex ultrasound. That's only if you think there's a problem developing, and because the patency for the segments are so much better than everywhere else. But basically, for everywhere else, it's all three of these things at 3, 6, 12, and annually thereafter. Are people doing this? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Okay, good. More. I think that this is the difference between endovascular failure and limb failure for a lot of patients. If I'm telling you that 25 to 30 percent of your endovascular interventions, particularly for CLI, will need secondary intervention, you do not want to catch them when it has clunked. You want to catch them before that event, and this is going to be the mechanism to do that. So in summary, I think it's pretty clear that the need for secondary interventions is high. How paclitaxel shakes out over time will be a big determinant as to how high. Revascularization failure is associated with poor outcomes, and current surveillance programs lack consistency around the United States and Canada and all other countries. This is really what the local team does. And I really think that if we could put in a standard, a standard program like the one enunciated by the Society for Vascular Surgery, we should be able to prevent the worst outcomes by preventing full revascularization failure. With that, I'll say thanks very much for your attention.